Thank you for joining us today for leveraging post-secondary data to increase college access. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Jessica Bailey, who will be moderating today's webinar. Have a great session, Jess. Thank you, Ashley. Welcome, everybody. My name is Jessica Bailey, and I am a researcher for the RAL Northeastern Island. I'm also the facilitator of the RAL Partnership sponsoring this event, the Rhode Island Pipelines for College and Career Research Partnership, which I'll discuss in just a moment. The agenda for today's event, as you saw in the lobby, is um, including two presentations and one reflection. So after this brief welcome and introduction to today's presenters, we'll hear about how states in the RAL Northeastern Islands region are using administrative post-secondary data to increase college access. Next, we'll hear about one researcher's experience conducting effectiveness studies of college readiness and access programs. And finally, we will hear reflections on the presentation from a Rhode Island superintendent. We'll also have time for questions at the end of the presentation today. So as I just mentioned, today's presentation is part of the Rhode Island Pipelines to College and Career Research Partnership, which is a partnership among RALME, the Rhode Island Department of Education, the Rhode Island School Superintendents Association, and the Rhode Island Office of the Post-Secondary Commissioner. This partnership has a few initial priorities, including increasing public college access and degree completion rates, especially for high-need students, and strengthening school-to-career trajectories to increase preparation for and employment in middle and high-wage growth industries. One of the goals of this partnership, is, which we just initiated and will last for the term of our RELNI contract, which is the next five years, so one of the goals is to increase the capacity of district and school leaders um, to use post-secondary data to increase college readiness and enrollment. So we're currently preparing for projects and studies to address these priority issues and meet the partnership's goals. And part of this effort is offering today's bridge event. So for the goals of today's bridge event, we want to introduce you to strategies for using administrative post-secondary data to support college access, provide an overview of state's efforts to use linked secondary and post-secondary data to inform and improve practice, as well as describe an intervention aimed to reduce the phenomenon of summer melt, which is essentially college-bound seniors not enrolling in college in the fall after their graduation. So we have a great lineup of presenters today. First, we have Dr. Susan bowles Terrio. She is um, part of the RAL Northeastern Islands. She has conducted research and provided technical, technical assistance in the field of education policy for over 20 years. Her work focuses on state policy, support for low-performing schools, and high school turnaround. She's the director of the Massachusetts Early Warning Indicator System Project, and she's also served as a technical assist, assistance liaison for the National High School Center at the American Institutes for Research. And she's provided technical assistance through trainings, guides, tools, and presentations to support state-level policymakers on everything from improving high schools and the implementation of state, district, and school-level early warning systems. We also have Dr. Benjamin Castleman. He's an assistant professor of education and public policy at the University of Virginia. His research applies insights from behavioral economics and social, social psychology to improve college access and support for low-income and non-traditional students. He has conducted several randomized trials to investigate innovative strategies to help students and their families navigate complex educational decisions. And Dr. Castleman has presented his research at the White House Summit on Expanding College Opportunity and in testimony before Congress. He's a two-time winner of the 2014 Coalition for Evidence-Based Policy White House Office of Science and Technology Policy Competition for low-cost, randomized controlled trials and public policy. He has authored an ev or edited several books on topics such as summer melt and text messaging interventions. And his prior work experience includes serving as a public school teacher and administrator in Providence, Rhode Island. Finally, we have Dr. Peter Cummings. He is the superintendent of the Narragansett, Rhode Island Public Schools. 
and he has over 25 years of experience as a teacher and administrator in Connecticut and Rhode Island schools. He served as a superintendent, assistant superintendent, high school principal, elementary principal, high school English teacher, and also worked as a leader in residence with the Connecticut Center for School Change. Um, during his time as a principal, his schools were recognized at the state and national levels for academic excellence. And his leadership focused on systemic and sustainable development of school structures, professional learning systems, and instructional practices that support equity and achievement for all students. So we're very pleased to have such a great cast of presenters today. So I am going to turn it over to Dr. Susan Terrio, our first presenter for part one of our event. Dr. Terrio? Thank you, Jessica, and thanks to everyone for joining today. Um, it's really exciting, um, some of the work that um, uh, Dr. Castleman has done, and I hope that you get a lot out of it. I see that many of you are from um, College Access Program, so a little bit of this may be familiar, but I'm going to bring us all up to the same spot, and um, hopefully it's helpful to each of you. Um, so first, I just quickly wanted to emphasize why post-secondary education is so important. Um, it, it's really critical um, to uh, future success of students. 90% um, of the jobs in high growth industries um, with high wages um, do or will require some form of post-secondary education or training. So um, post-secondary readiness or meeting that post-secondary readiness benchmark has really important implications for students' future careers and accessing higher wages. Um, whether they decide to immediately enroll in post-secondary education after high school or determine that they need post-secondary education later in life, um, meeting, making sure students are post-secondary ready really ensures that they have the opportunity to access this um, later at any point in time in their life. Um, so there are challenges, um, as you can see. Um, though high school graduation rates have increased over the past decade, uh, there are still 20% of students who are not meeting um, this important high school graduation milestone um, within four years of starting high school. And since high school graduation is a, is a prerequisite for most post-secondary education opportunities, this is really important to understand and um, focus on. Further, um, recent statistics suggest that slightly more than half of men and 60% of women actually complete um, a four-year college degree within six years. Um, interestingly, though, these statistics uh, do not um, reflect student aspirations. Um, when, we, when students were asked about their aspirations for post-secondary education, 97% of high school students say they plan to pursue post-secondary education. Um, yet, we know that, these, that many students are not graduating from our high schools ready. It doesn't jive with the 20% of students who um, are not meeting that high school graduation milestone. Um, and educators will tell you there is certainly a gap between meeting the high school graduation benchmark and the post-secondary readiness um, education benchmark. These ACT statistics that, I, um, that are on the screen before you really exemplify these perceptions exemplify why educators have these perceptions. With only 26% of high school graduates in uh, 2013 meeting all four of the ACT college readiness benchmarks, and only 11% of graduates from low-income families meeting this benchmark. And <laughs> um, when you start to look at um, this, a recent report released by Ed Trust, really examining um, whether students actually have access to college and career readiness or a um, course uh, line of courses or a coherent set of courses. Only 10% of students from higher income households are, have access to access a college and career ready curriculum, and it's only 7% from lower income households. And 30%, 36% of higher income students and 24% of lower income students have access to a college-ready curriculum. This shows that about half, or 46% of students from higher income families um, actually are able to access a post-secondary readiness curriculum, whether it be focused primarily on post-secondary or college and career ready. And only a, about a third, 31% of students from low-income families have access to the same type of curriculum. So there's clearly a gap between aspirations, demand, and what students are prepared to do. 
So um, one question that we frequently get um, from state district school policymakers, stakeholders from all around is how do we start to think about this information differently? There's a gap in terms of information between the secondary level and post-secondary level. And so um, that creates a kind of gap in terms of a feedback loop. So um, one key strategy um, that stakeholders have begun to use is to develop data systems that allow stakeholders to examine and understand needs. So at the secondary level, which, which um, is taken from the K through 12 state longitudinal data systems, and at the post-secondary administrative data can both be used to support these efforts. So examples of the state strategies to support the efforts to increase post-secondary re readiness um, include um, feedback loops for schools and districts and opportunities to improve student outcomes. The types of data they're looking at at the secondary level include attendance, course performance, advanced coursework and graduation, and post-secondary administrative data include enrollment data, uh, persistence, which um, is usually defined as students enrolling full-time in the second year, completion, and degree attainment. So these are, again, some examples that states have been using to increase post-secondary readiness. Um, one is sort of an input approach. They're um, looking at the alignment between high school requirements and post-secondary requirements and really trying to raise high school graduation requirements or really defining what a post-secondary readiness sequence of courses looks like so that students have access to courses they need to be ready at po in the post-secondary level. Um, there's also a strategy to provide feedback to uh, schools focused on post-secondary outcomes. So for example, uh, the Rhode Island Data Hub or Massachusetts has um, developed a district analysis tool for outcomes after after high school, these both provide important information back to uh, high schools about what happens to their students after they graduate from high school. And then finally, uh, states have used administrative data to um, examine early warning indicators for post-secondary readiness, and I'll go into that a little bit in a moment. So I just wanted to give one example of high school graduation requirements. Um, so this is called, this is Math Corps, and this is the um, Massachusetts um, High School Program of Study for College Readiness. And this is a suggested um, set of courses and sequence of courses to be taken by students in order to be considered college ready. Um, as of 2014, approximately 72% of Massachusetts high school graduates had actually completed Math Corps. Now, um, some states actually do mandate this um, high school graduation requirement. Massachusetts is not an example of that. But if you are interested in state strategies to increase um, high school graduation requirements to improve post-secondary readiness, I encourage you to access the College and Career Readiness and Success Center's um, state profile, where they have, a, they have high school graduation requirement policies, and you can compare and contrast them from state to state. And you'll see some of the differences and similarities among them. Um, you can actually, you can access that um, from, the, from the web link that's in the slide or also in the chat box. Additionally, um, another example is the Massachusetts District Analysis and Review Tool. Now, this tool really um, allows um, districts and high schools to access information about what happens uh, in terms of success after high school and start to use that information to think about how they are or are not meeting the, their goals or what they believe should be occurring for students after they finish high school. So the tool really provides a lot of different information, and we'll go through a few examples in a moment, but it includes high school context, high school student level indicators, um, the programs of study, so percentages of students who passed, who've gone through math, graduated completion, completing math core, um, high school performance information, post-secondary education outcomes, and career development and trend analysis. I'm going to focus on a few of these, but um, you can see the link in the bottom of this slide, and that's a place where you can, um, you can explore this in more detail. So the first example I want to I want to provide to you here is the um, 
the Massachusetts District Analysis and Review Tool, or DART, um, for BASCOR. And so in this, in this, um, in the DART, you can actually select uh, a more than one high school, um, one, two, three, four high schools, and compare where one high school actually compares to another. So you can see here, I selected two high schools at random, and you can see the Groton Dunstable High School is at 100% across the board in terms of the percentages of students who are um, completing math core and graduating from high school, whereas Acton Boxborough has some ups and downs um, within, and in 2016, approximately 63% of those students reached that. So it allows um, schools to see their own trends, but also to identify um, and compare themselves to others. Additionally, you provide the state average, um, and so they can see their distance from the state average. It's a good feedback loop for making decisions about you know, whether they're actually um, meeting the goals that they've designed for their students. This is another example of, a, of part of the, the success after high school DART. It focuses on early warning indicators. And, and this really gets at a kind of early indicator type of look. Um, Massachusetts has defined high school readiness as students who are likely to pass all ninth grade courses. And in this instance, they're providing information on the percentage of students who are actually passing ninth grade courses um, from between 2011 and, in this case, 2014. Now, the reason that this indicator is so important um, is that in research, they've identified that students who pass all ninth grade, grade courses are significantly more likely to um, graduate from high school. So this is important information that a school or district could use early on to start to see how their system is dealing with this and whether they might need to um, think about new strategies um, for supporting more, to ensure more ninth graders are actually on track for high school graduation and passing ninth grade courses. Um, and then I have one more example. Um, again, this is the DART, and it's, this is a real opportunity for the kind of what I call the lagging data. So this is the space where it is very difficult for high schools to know what actually happens to students after they leave high school, their high, graduate from their high school, and then go on to post-secondary education. And so this actually shows among the students who go to post-secondary education, the percentage who graduate, uh, who are enrolled in college immediately following their high school graduation, as well as those who are persistently enrolled in college. And again, it allows the districts and schools to compare themselves to other districts and schools and see where they stand in terms of the state average. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Jeff to um, give everyone a poll. Thanks, Susan. This is really helpful information. We've posted some links in the chat along the way um, from what Susan was discussing. So in case you wanted to um, just go and take a look at any of those um, resources that she mentioned, the links are in the chat, and they're also in the download files um, if you download today's slides. So um, now we're going to turn to a poll, and just to see um, what your knowledge of um, here we go. So if you want to take a minute to answer this question, you know, does your state make college data about graduates available to high school? It's fine if you don't know, but please take a moment to vote if you'd like. Okay, it's looking like many of you don't know, about over half of you actually do not know. Some of you um, do you know, it'd be great if we could know, um, break this down by state and see kind of the data disaggregated by state where y'all are responding from. Um, but feel free to answer this in the chat as well if you'd like to just inform us what state you're in and or territory and whether your state or territory makes college data available to graduates, um, about graduates available to high schools. That would be really interesting conversation to kind of have on the sidebar. But again, it's looking like probably over half of you don't know, but um, about a third of you say that, yes, your, your state or territory is making data available to high schools. That's great. 
and some great, um, great, you guys are all taking it away in the chat. Yes, in California and in Kentucky, New Mexico, it looks like it. So that's great. So feel free to keep going here as um, we continue the presentation. I'm going to now turn it over to our next presenter, <clears throat> Dr. Ben Kasselman, who is going to discuss his experience conducting effectiveness studies of college readiness and access programs using administrative data. So Dr. Kasselman, please take it away. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the chance to be here. Uh, I, I'm both grateful for, for the chance to share some of the work my colleagues and I have done, but I'm a very proud former Rhode Islander, having lived in Providence and Cranston for about 15 years, so always uh, appreciative of the chance to reconnect with uh, Rhode Island colleagues and, of course, people from around the country. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about my background and motivation. Um, I'm the guy in the upper left corner in the green shirt. This is the 16-year-ago version of me. And I had the privilege and opportunity to be an advisor uh, at the Met School in Providence, Rhode Island, and then to work as an administrator at the Met for several years. Uh, this is a group of students in my advisory who I stayed with throughout high school. Um, and I'm sure, as, as many of you would say, for the students that you work with, uh, these students were very smart, very ambitious, uh, creative learners, many of whom who had overcome a fair amount of obstacles and adversity in their lives to be successful in high school. I think one of the innovative things among many that we did at the Met was integrate college applications into the senior year curriculum and, uh, and supported our students to identify colleges to apply to, to fill out applications and apply for financial aid. And we were very uh, proud to see many of our students be accepted to college and plan to enroll. Um, as any teachers and administrators on the line I'm sure can relate to, you can then also imagine our disappointment to see about a third of our students struggle the summer after high school uh, to navigate uh, required uh, financial and procedural tasks that they had to complete in order to enroll. Um, and that, as I said, led about a third of them to reconsider where even whether to go to college. And so the experience of seeing my own students who I had spent several years with struggle in the face of, of these unforeseen challenges the summer after high school um, led me to, to really focus on this, this summer melt topic as a, as a core area of my early research. Um, of course, the summer after high school is just one of many uh, uh, complex decisions and critical transitions that students face in higher education. So uh, across the country, especially in urban districts, anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of college attending high school graduates who've, like my students at the Met, applied to college, gotten in, in most cases um, applied for financial aid and chosen where to go as at the end of high school, failed to matriculate anywhere in the year after high school. Even among students who are in college, um, roughly two out of 10 students in their first year who have a GPA of 3.0 or higher and who received a Pell Grant failed to refile FAFSA. Um, and you can imagine uh, failure to refile FAFSA is strongly negatively associated with staying in college or getting a degree. Even if we look substantially further down the pipeline, students who've completed 75% of the credit typically needed to graduate, uh, roughly or as many as three out of 10 of those students at broad access institutions, our community colleges, our less selective uh, four-year institutions, withdraws prior to earning a degree um, and doesn't return uh, within, within several years. So I think this summer melt is symptomatic of a broader set of critical transitions and complex decisions students face. And so hopefully the, the strategies that I'll share with you now about how to address summer melt are, are perhaps useful at, at some of these other um, uh, transitions as well. Um, in terms of how we kind of first learned about summer melt, um, this, this really rewinds about 10 years now. Um, I was still an administrator at the Med, and we had um, the opportunity at the time to work with a, a, a fantastic professor at Boston College named Karen Arnold to, to do a longitudinal study of our high school graduates. The Met, is, as many of you may know, is a pretty innovative and different high school curriculum, and so we wanted to see how students who went through this curriculum fared afterwards. Um, and I think it's really important to understand the context that, um, in which uh, the Met was, your, many of your schools were, and that, that we were doing this study. Um, you know, my recollection as an administrator who oversaw our college and transition staff at the Met in the mid-2000s was this was a time where, you know, we really were trying to support every student to go to college uh, with more or, I think at the time a focus on access than affordability and certainly I think more of a focus on access than persistence or success. Uh, this is also pre-Great Recession where there was certainly freer and less regulated access to student loans. 
Um, and, and so that provide a source of liquidity for students to pay the cost of college, even if their family resources were perhaps more constrained. Um, I think we at the Met, um, and I guess at many of your high schools, felt that our role was to help students get in, um, perhaps help them make informed choices about where to attend, um, but then to you know give them a hug on graduation stage and, and send them on our way. We, we provided, within the Met, um, a limited amount of transition support uh, for students when they were uh, going into college, but of course at many schools that extend beyond school staffing ability. Um, and so it was, it was kind of beyond our ability to, to comprehensively support students as much as we might want to. And at the time, we didn't really have or know about uh, data sources we could draw on to, to track students' progress through college. Um, so again, going back about a decade when we were working with Professor Arnold to really understand our students' uh, path to college, these are the, the kind of data points that, that stood out to us. We knew from our own data because we, we could see um, where our students applied and celebrate their acceptances. Almost all of our students were accepted to college. And every year, about 80% of them planned to go. Um, and in the years uh, prior to when we had the chance to work with Professor Arnold, um, of the students who came back and visited us, um, about 80% told us that they were in college. And so it seemed to us from student self-reports um, that most of the students, if not all of the students who were planning to go, um, were in fact enrolled. And so back in 2007, uh, I as an administrator, my colleagues weren't as aware as, as we are now, and many of us are now, about the National Student Clearinghouse. Um, and so Professor Arnold pointed this resource out to us. And so when we pulled the National Student Clearinghouse data that allowed us to observe through administrative data sources enrollments, not just institutions in Rhode Island, but many institutions around the country, we saw a much lower rate of enrollment. And this really motivated us to focus on the summer between when students told us they were planning to go to college and the fall, a couple months later, when unfortunately a sizable share weren't enrolling and, and see how, what we could do to, to close that gap. Um, and and I, you know, I do want to point out that, that this summer melt phenomenon, as I mentioned before, is not unique to Providence and to the, to the students in the Met uh, where we observe this data. Uh, when my colleague Lindsay Page and I, uh, our other colleagues of ours, have looked at, at rates of summer melt in other parts of the country, um, we have found similarly high melt rates. So 20% of students in Boston, 20% in Fulton County, Georgia, uh, upwards of 30% in places like Dallas. So, you know, I think in, in terms of, of, of informing how we might approach effectively supporting students uh, through this critical time period, it's of course important to ask why students would melt in the first place. And, and um, you know, what we've learned over lots of years of, of research and talking to practitioners and school leaders, um, also drawing on, on our own direct experience, is that even after being accepted to college and choosing where to attend, Low-income students in particular have to complete a variety of complex tasks, everything from verifying the income and asset information they provide on their FAFSA to evaluating and considering supplementary loan options to paying uh, unanticipated fees that arise, so a fee to attend orientation, a fee to apply for housing. Um, and then on top of that, uh, they're also completing a variety of procedural tasks, registering for orientation or placement tests, completing housing applications, deciding whether they can stay on their family's health insurance or, or use their institutional health insurance. And all of these tasks arise at a time where students typically have access, little access to professional assistance. So uh, in the mid-2000s, um, at the Met, our counselors typically worked nine or ten month contracts like our teachers. Students had typically um, not, were not yet connected to supports available in their college. And, and we found, for the most part, that students' parents very much wanted to help them but didn't have the direct experience to provide expert guidance. Uh, over a several year period, my colleague Lindsay Page, uh, others, and I have pursued a variety of strategies to reduce summer melt. Um, and that's ranged from partnering with school districts and nonprofit organizations to provide proactive outreach from counselors during the summer after high school. That's the first thing we did at the Met in 2008. We retained a couple of our counselors during the summer and had them reach out to students and uh, see if students were encountering any challenges, um, and if so, to, to help them overcome those challenges to enrollment. We've also um, used 
peer mentors um, who were in college and had gone through a lot of the same challenges as a source of outreach, encouragement, and support. And then where I'll talk about mostly in the time that I've left um, is a personalized text messaging strategy that we've used to provide students with information about tasks they have to complete in order to successfully matriculate that, that we've since extended to a variety of other kind of important post-secondary margins. Um, these are projects we've done both in Providence but in numerous urban districts and, and for that matter in our rural context and statewide work around the country. Um, and in the summer melt specifically um, have reached out to tens of thousands of students. Uh, so have learned a lot about the kind of impact these campaigns can have in a variety of different um, settings and environments. Uh, so I mentioned this kind of text messaging campaign to, to mitigate summer melt. Um, the early campaigns that we did, and, and really the, to the extent that we've replicated these, these are you know texting campaigns that consist of about 10 messages over the course of a summer. So it's not a message every day, certainly. It's not even really several messages a week. It's about one message um, a week about important, timely tasks students need to complete in order to follow through on their own intentions to matriculate in college. So everything from finalizing their financial aid to registering for orientation and placement tests uh, to paying their tuition bills or, or signing up for tuition payment plans. On the right, you can see an example of a text message that a student received. Um, so this is personalized to the student. Hi, Alex. Personalized to her institution. Have you signed up for the UMass Boston orientation in this case? Um, gives information about the date by when the student needs to register, a link that enables Alex to, to do this task right from her mobile phone, um, and very importantly, invites the student to write back and connect one-on-one -on -one, uh, with an advisor if she needs assistance. Really important to point out that this is not me or my colleagues tapping out one message at a time at our, um, to a student on our phone. As I'll show you in just a moment, this is combining um, data that schools can, can collect from their students with publicly available data on tasks students have to complete at colleges and universities, stitching those two sources of data together to push out in the same way that we would with an email merge, highly personalized content in an automated fashion to you know, hundreds of thousands of students if we, if we wanted to. Um, so I imagine I'm, I don't have to make this case so much now, um, um, but certainly one that I perhaps had more to persuade people about five years ago when we started doing this. You know, what can one or a, set of, a series of text messages do to affect a big decision like going to college? Um, and I think even though text messages are very short, they, they pack a pretty powerful punch. So every message we receive, every text we receive, um, our phones chirp, they vibrate, and they demand our attention. I, my guess is just in the course of this webinar, many of us have gotten texts, and even though we're interested in the content, have looked down and, and seen who's writing, uh, right? That's what phones are designed to do. Um, and because texts stand out um, as their own message, uh, whatever's in them really captures our attention. So that's a really powerful feature. Another powerful feature of text is that because they have to be short, it forces educators, researchers, policymakers to break down complex um, ideas into, and, and information into consolidated, timely bursts of information for students. Um, messages are also potentially very powerful because they're prompting people to follow through on important actions they might otherwise be putting off. So if all I did was send a student um, a text with the word FAFSA once a week for 10 weeks, they're more likely to complete it because FAFSA is now top of mind. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned earlier, text can make it really easy, uh, interactive text can make it really easy for students to connect to one-on-one -on -one assistance. It doesn't require a student to pick up a phone, look up someone's email address, go into a building. Um, it can be as simple as writing back to a message, and, and we can design this in a way that's really easy for students to connect to assistance. I mentioned the data behind summer melt, uh, summer melt text, and I just want to give you an example of, of really, I think, how straightforward this can be. Uh, we worked with our school district, our, our nonprofit partners, typically to administer high school exit surveys. Um, and in those exit surveys, we asked students their name, if they were planning to go to college, and if so, where, and their cell phone number, and consent to receive messages. And so that's the data you see in the top spreadsheet. Um, and then we had research assistants, or increasingly now we can just use data science strategies to scrape information from college websites. Um, so I would go to the URI um, 
admitted students website and see what admitted students that you or I have to complete. I do the same thing at Rhode Island College, the same thing at Johnson & Wales, and that goes into a separate spreadsheet. You can see there's a you know, column for registration date, column for a link for registration, and that would go all the way to the right for tuition information, financial aid. Um, these two spreadsheets then just get um, stitched together by a text messaging platform, of which there are now numerous on the market. Um, and um, that allows the platforms to send out highly personalized content to each of your individual students. Um, you know, what's been most important to us, uh, certainly as researchers, is to kind of uh, design our summer melt studies in a way where we can really isolate the unique impact um, of these texting campaigns on student outcomes separate from all the other factors that we know impact enrollment. Um, and so what you see here are the results from randomized trials where we uh, identified students who had gotten into college plan to go and, and randomly assigned them to either receive our texts or not. We do that, of course, not because we want to deny students a service that might be beneficial, but to uh, identify for educational leaders, practitioners, funders, um, and, and, and policymakers the benefit, the value add that these kinds of interventions can have. And, and what you see is for a very modest investment, um, summer maltexting can lead both to improvements in college enrollment overall, um, but particularly pronounced impacts for, for populations of important interest. So low-income students, first-generation college students, uh, these text campaigns can increase enrollment by anywhere from 7 to 8 percentage points. Uh, we've, as I mentioned before, we've since uh, used similar texting strategies across a variety of critical transitions. So everything from helping students complete their financial aid applications in the, in the first place or to renew financial aid. Um, and I, in a moment, I'll talk about some, some applications further down the pipeline. Uh, what we have found is, is a consistent pattern of positive impacts, whether these strategies of providing students with personalized information through communications channels they're using on a daily basis and making it really easy to get assistance, positive impacts across a range of decisions. So whether that's filing a financial aid application early in the year to maximize how much aid students receive, whether that's um, completing supplementary financial forms like the CSS profile, um, or whether it's encouraging students to renew financial aid, um, we're seeing you know, positive and substantial impacts from this low cost and quite scalable strategy. Um, I alluded a moment ago to kind of our interest in extending this even further into college, and I mentioned before this kind of near-completer phenomenon. And this, this graph here is work that one of my colleagues, Zach Mabel at Harvard, has done, showing um, that a substantial share of students, as I mentioned earlier, um, who um, made it very far in college, you know, completed 50, 75 percent of the credits they need to graduate, um, withdraw prior to earning their degree. And I think this is another great example of, of how administrative data can be used. This is uh, drawn on administrative data in Florida and Ohio, I believe, and revealed a phenomenon near completer withdrawal that up until very recently I don't think was on many um, practitioners, researchers, or administrators' radar. So, of course, identifying this phenomenon with, with administrative data the same way we did earlier with Summer Melt has catalyzed the development of, of, of some important intervention work to, to increase completion. Uh, so we're very uh, uh, grateful um, to have the support of, of IES um, and, and the partnership with five different uh, higher education systems and institutions in Texas, Virginia, the University of New York, uh, Ohio, and Washington to design a similar um, mobile messaging nudge campaign to um, help students who have completed substantial credits but are at risk of withdrawal to set goals um, for the coming term, to access beneficial academic and financial resources, and to meet and, and be aware of upcoming and important um, deadlines. And, and that's, uh, for anyone who's interested, we should be uh, posting a working paper with results from the first year um, of, this, uh, of this pilot um, in the next week or so. So if anyone's interested, please reach out. I'm, I'm happy to, to share that with you. I think it's really important in the few minutes that I have left to kind of, you know, broaden out and make, I think, a very explicit point, which is I think what has made these campaigns effective is not just that it's been through text messaging, right? Text messaging 
is a means of accomplishing broader goals, of providing students with personalized information, encouragement, uh, nudges to not put off important tasks, and means of accessing personalized assistance. It's also really important to re recognize, though, that texting is becoming somewhat saturated as a channel. So the College Board, the Common Application, um, several states, West Virginia, uh, Delaware, larger states like Texas, um, are using text messaging to commu communicate with students about educational decisions. And of course, many of us now get texts about all kinds of things, doctor's visits, dentist visits, airline. My county tax collector somehow even has my phone number and is texting me to pay my tax bill. Um, the more that any channel, whether it was email before it or texting now, becomes saturated, uh, the more likely we are going to have to figure out uh, additional creative means to communicate with students. Um, and I think that points us in a couple of directions. One is the importance of thinking about new channels. Any of you Mad Men fans on the webinar may remember Harry Crane, who in the 1950s brought to this um, ad firm this kind of newfangled idea of advertising through television, which was revolutionary for a firm that at the time was only doing print and, and kind of billboard type ads. Um, of course, the private sector for at least that time has been at the frontier of staying ahead of, of how people communicate. And I think it's very important in the public sector and education, we adopt a similar mentality. So whether that's Snapchat, WhatsApp, Kick, Facebook Messenger, if we want to meet our students where they are, texting works for right now, but I think undoubtedly we're going to have to continue to move forward uh, with creative means of outreach. I also think it means we need to get more out of mobile than just using text message to provide text in the literal sense of words and phrases. So in a lot of our current campaigns, we're using text to embed creative and hopefully well-designed infographics um, or short video clips that hopefully convey information in a way that further captures students' attention and, and increases comprehension. Uh, and then finally, an area of particular interest for mine, I think there's tremendously high ceiling to combine both these behavioral nudge strategies and interactive technologies with some of the kind of frontier uh, applications of, of, of big data and data science. Um, so I give you a kind of very data science light example of providing students with information about the task they have to complete at their intended college or university, but there's lots of things we could do. We could provide students with informa personalized information about courses they need to complete to finish a program of study. Uh, we could provide students with personalized nudges about academic supports that are likely to be particularly beneficial to them. And I think really the sky's the limit um, to personalize our message content identify pathways that appear to position students for success, and help students connect to resources that are likely to be particularly beneficial for them. Um, if you'd like to learn more about uh, the types of, of work we're doing and the ways we're applying these strategies at scale, both in, in post-secondary ed, but really pre-K um, through, through college and in criminal justice, workforce development, other domains, you can check out our website. Um, and I'm very excited to engage in, in discussion as we go forward. Thank you. Okay, hey, great. Well, thank you so much, Ben. That was a lot of information, a lot of very useful information, and, and a lot to take in. So I want us just to take a moment now to turn to a chat so we can hear a little bit from you all um, in the chat box. So we're going to make it a little bit bigger. So we'll take a few minutes. If you want to just enter into the space below um, an example of a way you have used or you think that you could use post-secondary data to inform your work, we'd love to hear from you. We've been having a very um, great discussion so far during the presentation about some ways in which You've been using um, different interventions like text messaging or Snapchat, Facebook, other ways. Um, so continue the conversation here, and um, then we'll hear some reflections from Dr. Peter Cummings in a few minutes. I see that some of you are um, entering some text over on the small chat on the left. If you want to just enter into the big chat in the center of the screen, that would be great. And I know that you um, all may have some questions for our presenters, so feel free to put those into the smaller chat. We'll capture them and answer those during the Q&A session later. Okay, great. It looks like we have um, 
a few examples from Emma Lou May for grant writing. You use some post-secondary data there. That's great. Um, from Dina, for the UW ETS, sharing the data has helped us get financial support from our host institution. Um, for project development, developing early warning indicators. Using, it, using the data to measure the impact of current college readiness curriculum for college entrance and persistence. That's great. So Larry Ramos, you said that you used it for um, na national clearinghouse data for training of staff and informing colleagues. Um, it would be great if you want to expand on what those, who your colleagues are, or what staff are trained. A lot of great examples here. And um, Tom C. said to inform a statewide campaign to increase post-secondary attainment. Great, what state are you from? And when Derby, it's, it's interesting to hear um, what you've shared about the percentage of high school graduates that actually matriculated by school and then further disaggregating the data to target groups of students. That's actually um, a project that RELME is undertaking right now in Rhode Island as part of this partnership where we'll be working with superintendents to do exactly that. That's great. OK, Tom C. in Vermont. OK, great. See if anyone else would like to share. Really great. Oh, I love that idea, um, Purnell Goodwin, the Snapchat for our group messaging app so all the students who are coming can converse with each other. That's really nice. Great. And we're getting some other questions over in the side chat too. So yeah, feel free to continue to post those. I think I will. Um, move us back to the presentations that we can begin to hear from Dr. Peter Cummings. And he's going to share some of his reflections on um, Ben Kaufman's and Susan Terrio's presentations. And um, so um, Dr. Cummings, uh, Superintendent of Narragansett, Rhode Island, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, well, it's it's really been a pleasure to hear about the research and actions uh, from Susan and Ben. And as we reflect on this, you know, I would certainly like to invite Susan and Ben to chime in, you know, as they see fit, uh, as we discuss some of the questions and um, repercussions of the pieces that they've put forward. I think overall, one of the things that we really want to hang on to from a K-12 lens is not just developing the data. I think the Massachusetts model is an excellent one, but how do we interpret the data? And you know, when we're looking at what people are putting up from the chats and thinking through what our next steps are, um, not only at K-12, but at college institutions, you know, what is the data telling us uh, in terms of interpreting root costs? So for example, when I start to think about how do we make the experience smaller for students, and by that, um, what I'm really thinking about, and Ben, I'd, I'd love for you to be able to chime in on this, um, in terms of building relationships with students through text or making them really want to make a connection with a faculty member or someone that makes them really want to be involved at the college level, you know, how um, has your research you know, indicated that the students are building relationships. One of the things that we really try to do K-12, um, certainly in Rhode Island and certainly in other um, states in New England, is focus on advisories and really being sure that students are feeling a sense of belonging and making big institutions feel smaller. 
Um, and so certainly, you know, texting is one way to do that because it's a bit of personalization. Uh, but what we are really also trying to do is make sure that each student feels like they're not on their own. So Ben, I don't know if you want to um, chime in on any piece of that. Sure, I, I'm happy to. You know, I, I think it's a great question. Um, and I, you know, I think it's a particularly crucial question during these, these times of transition. So um, you know, when students are in a high school and feel that sense of belonging in a community that they're familiar with, um, especially with a, with a strong advisory structure in place like it sounds like you have, um, you know, I, I think it, it's perhaps more straightforward to, to establish those relationships. Um, certainly once students have successfully transitioned to college and identified a peer group or have gotten connected to a program of study, hopefully those relationships also have chances to form. Um, you know, I'm particularly interested in, as I mentioned, students navigating these kind of critical transitions and, and how we help students form relationships, form senses of belonging, and, and I think often very importantly overcome belonging anxiety as, as they move from one environment to another is, is really crucial. Um, I will say that across projects we see students um, often very willing to exchange, to engage in rich exchanges with people remotely via text or through other channels. Um, of course, I think they're most likely to do so when that individual on the other end is someone with whom they have a prior relationship or connection. So um, College Summit, which many of you may, uh, may be familiar with, is a, uh, a college uh, success organization operating in lots of different parts of the country. They're doing really innovative right, work right now using peer leaders um, to stay connected to students via text as they transition from high school over the summer and into college um, as a way of kind of maintaining the relationship and helping students then establish similar networks when they've, they've gone to higher education institutions. So uh, I'll stop there just so others can engage as well, but I, I think it's a really crucial point. And I think, you know, certainly, um, you know, as Ben indicates, being intentional about developing those relationships certainly is something that um, we focus on very much uh, in the K-12 setting. I think another piece that we often hear um, from students when they uh, come back to us, and this is uh, more qualitative information that we get when we um, have a practice of interviewing our um, graduates a year later and so we go to them and ask them how was your first year what did you learn and you know our goal is to get from them did you feel well prepared um, we often get back that the um, the instruction can be very different between the high school level and the college level and you know I, I uh, one of the things I think about a lot is that there's a, a huge focus on pedagogy on personalization of instruction and effective use of instructional technology in many, uh, you know, pre-K-12 settings. Um, you know, one of the things that we often are, are trying to figure out is, is that same thing happening at the college level? And so we really want to be sure that we're using the best pedagogical practices as we do professional learning with our teachers. Uh, we often wonder, is the same thing happening at the college level in terms of engaging students and making the learning accessible to them. So, for example, um, one of the things that we have done a great deal with is doing longer term, deeper projects and giving students all different sorts of feedback, not just on how they're doing, but how they went about the process. And you know, we really look to our college partners to give us feedback around that. But that's something that we are seeking on our own. And I know, Susan, you've done quite a bit of research on the types of data that are getting back to high schools, both from within high schools and from colleges. You know, to your knowledge, has there been any real studies that build on the, um, for example, the Massachusetts data? that is not just getting to a level of achievement, but also the types of learning that students are doing? Uh, that's a really good question, Peter, that I cannot fully answer, but I can, kind of, I can talk a little bit about sort of the theory of action of 
starting to link the secondary and post-secondary data. Um, and when states and or districts are doing this work, um, they're trying to create, make the links, allow us to use those, th that information to actually get feedback on what's happening. And in terms of a state education agency, it then is getting handed off right to the local district and school to use as they as they will um, and so I think that um, they they see that handoff as a as a local decision in terms of trying to make decisions about how they're going to use the data and the types of questions that you that they have um, and the one that you raised for example and I I, I know anecdotally of instances, as you described, of um, you know high districts that send a large majority of students to certain um, post-secondary institutions, recognizing that there's some issues there, and actually engaging and reaching out to the post-secondary institution um, to start to have some conversations about alignment, about expectations, and about um, what's going well and what isn't. And um, so I I think that um, this. The linking of the data is important because it gives people with content and professional expertise um, quick information to start to think about what this means in terms of their practice, their goals, and um, the types of um, strategies they're going to go they're going to take, such as reaching out to the post-secondary institutions to make you know different decisions or adjust approaches so that students are more ready. That's great. And, Peter, you know, can I just interrupt a, you for one second? I'm so sorry. Could you just speak up, please? Um, some of the participants are having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. Sure thing. I'm battling a bad cold, so I'm <laughs> trying oh, to sorry. be as that loud better. as I can here. Um, so, you know, Susan, I think that you really get to this idea of, you know, what data are we looking at and how are we getting to root cause? And so, for many of our, for a lot of our work in K-12, you know, so traditionally um, and culturally, for us, it's been about getting students in, and you know, how do we switch that conversation to how do we get them in and get them to stay? And you know, one of the pieces that is certainly so useful for us is the National Student Clearinghouse data that will tell us how students are persisting. I think for our next step, what we would really like to learn more data about and, and understand better is what are students identifying as getting in the way of their finishing. So sometimes, for example, again, this is anecdotal, when we will talk to a student, they will say, the classes I need aren't offered at the right time or I can't um, afford to go and uh, work because the classes won't match, or um, it may be they didn't accept, I had to take remedial classes and so it didn't count towards my graduation and it just went for too long. For us, the remedial classes data is really important because it helps us to make sure that our rigor and our level of um, learning is at such that students are able to access uh, classes at the right level. Um, and I think the second piece of that for us is really around our early college programs. And one of the great things that is happening in Rhode Island is that we have a robust dual enrollment program. And so I don't know either Susan or Ben if you've had any um, indicators or anything around the effectiveness of dual enrollment programs in terms of college completion. What we are finding is that we're having lots and lots of students, certainly here in Rhode Island, and I think it's also true in some other states, that are taking advantage of that uh, opportunity to earn credits at either the community college level or university level, and then be able to transfer them to the um, to the institution where they enroll. Um, Susan, I'll, just, I'll let you weigh in if if you have insights about the kind of impact of dual enrollment on completion. Okay, I have uh, uh, 
a little bit of a distance, but I do have some information about that. So, um, yeah, so um, there was a national study um, on early college high schools, a randomized control trial, um, looking at um, student outcomes for students who participate in early college high school model of dual enrollment. And um, they found that it did have a significant impact in terms of the numbers of students who were um, enrolling and persisting in college. There, uh, the study is underway in terms of determining um, whether students take that to completion. Um, so I, do, I am aware of that as, a, as a, an evidence-based practice. Um, and for folks who are interested in a really quick and dirty um, review of that evidence base, um, the College and Career Readiness and Success Center actually released a piece on evidence-based practices focused on specifically on early college high school. And you can get the citations for the research as well as a summary of the research and the student subgroups for which um, the, the strategy is effective. Um, you know, the re some of the reasons behind that that we suspect underlie that are, you know, it lowers the, um, it improves students' access to college in terms of understanding the social, the expectations in classrooms, um, if they are going to a campus, the kind of social conditions under which they're going to school, getting familiar with um, what it's like to be in higher, in po a post-secondary institution, as well, uh, and um, indeed, they did find that students who did attend those programs on a camp, on a college campus, were um, you know were more successful. Though um, they found that they were successful in those instances, um, and so that's just something to consider. Um, and I, I'm not surprised, Peter, that you've been seeing some success because it also um, is an issue with finances. Truthfully, um, students do not have to pay for school for as long, and um, we know that finances can get in the way of completion, and so um, students who, you know, complete up, some, up to two years of college prior to entering um, have you know, only two more years to finish a degree. Um, so that's another kind of big incentive. Ben, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I do not. <laughs> okay. Great. Well, I'll just wrap up my reflections by saying I think the um, – the research that both Ben and Susan present have huge implications for the uh, K-12 setting in that, you know, it really indicates that we need to look both at academic preparation in terms of is our level of rigor um, at a place where students can walk into a post-secondary setting and find success and have the tools both learning to learn tools and academic skills. And it also has to do with the building of relationships and making sure that they have a sense of belonging and are going to a place where they want to be. And so as we develop our partnerships and systems and structures with um, you know, our most prominent institutions, so Narragansett, for example, is right next to the University of Rhode Island. We have a robust relationship with them. Um, you know, those two strands of research are really going to inform our practice, the work of our guidance counselors, and the work of our high school um, administration. So I really appreciate learning about it. All right. Thank you so much, Peter, for those questions and reflections. I think it's always great to hear from a practitioner who's sort of in the weeds and doing this stuff day to day. So thank you. So now we are going to turn to a question and answer period. So I've been encouraging you all to post questions in the chat box throughout the presentation. And if you haven't yet, uh, feel free to do that now about any of the presentation that you've heard so far today. And we've been holding the questions that we have received so far. So we're going to work our way through those questions. And I'll pose them to the presenters. And um, as I said, while we go, if you have additional questions, we will do our best to get to those. So one of the first questions that we had, um, I think actually I saw a couple of questions related to this about kind of the level of effort or time that it takes to collect all of the information regarding schedules or milestones from the colleges that the students matriculated to. So all of that information that needed to be set up for the automated text. So perhaps, Ben, you could speak to that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, what, what I should have mentioned and what I, what I didn't is that what we first tried to understand is where um, 
students from the districts that we partnered with or the communities that we partnered with typically went to college. And, and what we have found, I, I, I haven't done as much active summer remote work over the last few years, uh, last couple years, but what we found was that 80, 90 percent of students were going to one of 10 to 12 colleges and universities in, in a couple places. 90% of students were going to one of two institutions. Um, there's certainly a, a kind of long tail, so to speak, of students, let's say a student from Providence who goes to University of Washington out, out 3,000 miles away, but that is typically um, the exception. And so for the 80, 90% of students that went to one of seven or eight or 10 or 12 institutions, we would literally just have research assistants Google Rhode Island College uh, admitted students, U URI admitted students, and assemble information that way. And that was really not too time intensive. Um, for the students who intended to go somewhere way far away, there's too many of the kind of one-off students, one at University of Washington, one at Arizona State, et cetera. Um, and so we just prepared a generic set of texts that instead of saying, you know, the orientation at um, URI is on July 15th, they would say something like, your orientation is uh, maybe coming up soon. And we have found, I didn't present them on the slides, but we've also found um, positive significant impacts on enrollment even when we're just sending those, those more generic texts. Thanks, Ben. I think you answered a few people's um, questions regarding that. The next question actually will be for you, Ben. It's about did um, you run into any issues with obtaining parent consent? consent? when you were using the text messaging for students, um, especially if they were using a cell phone that was paid for by their parents? That's a great question. Um, you know, what I, what I always, any consent related questions, my, my answer is always, um, it probably goes without saying, I'm not an attorney, right? So I can't offer by any means an expert legal opinion. Um, my encouragement advice is always to consult local legal counsel uh, and ask them these questions because, um, my observation, uh, having no legal expertise myself, is that each legal counsel at a district level or nonprofit level interprets um, FERPA guidelines, other guidelines, state, state requirements slightly differently. And so getting a sense of what your legal counsel's opinion on this is really important. That being said, my non-legal um, understanding has been that students um, do not need to obtain parental consent to receive text messages, um, even if they are under 18. Again, I would emphasize that, that obviously subject to district or school-specific guidelines and legal review and, and potentially state as well. So uh, sorry to give a, a kind of evasive answer, but, but our experience has been with our partners, their local legal counsel have determined that students do not need parental consent to receive texts. That's great, thank you. Um, and now I'm not sure if Ben or Susan want to answer this, but a question was whether text messages can be used as a contact for TRIO. So I, this is Susan. I don't know the answer to that. Um, ben, I don't know if you do. No, I don't know that definitively, unfortunately. Um, I am aware of um, demonstration projects that um, uh, NCEE, the kind of evaluation arm within IES, has conducted with other, uh, with federal college access programs, Outward Bound, Gear Up, uh, EOC, um, that have been able to use text as part of the demonstration. So, uh, you know, it probably depends perhaps on the specific program and, um, and the location where it's being implemented. Uh, but I, I, I couldn't give a blanket answer one way or the other. Okay, thank you. Um, and now there's another question about how are states that are gathering data for students in college post-graduation gathering their data? And this might be something that Ben or Susan, you might be able to speak to, or others that are on the presentation today, um, feel free to, to um, share your response as well. Oh, this is Susan. Um, maybe Ben kind of hit the nail on the head. The um, National Student Clearinghouse has um, the bulk of these data um, in the, you know, in the easiest, it, it, it's e easiest to access because they have a national data set. Um, and basically they have the data of any student who's completed a um, financial aid 
form of FAFSA, and so they have um, a lot of data on these students, and it's really the most comprehensive resource. Um, other states that, um, that have a large percentage of students who go to in-state um, colleges or um, community colleges or universities, they sometimes will set up a, um, a, an agreement between them, and so you could get a large percentage of students in that way. I know in the state where I live, which is Massachusetts, that's not really very useful um, because students go to so many different institutions. They don't necessarily, a, a, a decent percentage stay in the Massachusetts state system of higher ed, but um, there's a much greater percentage that don't do that. So I know in the case of Massachusetts, they use student clearinghouse data. And I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that. No, I, I, I think that's largely what I would have responded as well. And going back to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the question about TRIO, we have some people that are um, talking about that in the chat about whether it can be counted as contact. And so if you haven't checked out what they're saying over there, then please um, refer to the chat for that. Now there was another question, um, I think it's geared towards Ben. It's someone, um, Ophelia Griggs, who works for the DCCS Community College, and she said that you indicated um, most of what you indicated is something that our department uses, such as texting. We utilize social media as well, and you mentioned that the BCCS would do a pilot via texting, and will it include all of the 23 BCCS community colleges or selected ones? Uh, great question. So we um, have had a tremendous opportunity to partner with VCCS on this Nudges for Near Completers project I described. Um, we piloted the project with two of the 23 institutions in um, the 2016-2017 academic year. We are expanding to seven total institutions starting in uh, the calendar year 2018. Um, and um, are kind of actively exploring a variety of projects in partnership with colleagues both at the system and institution level. So um, if these types of projects are of interest um, and you wanted to reach out offline, um, uh, um, I'd be happy to discuss further. You could also, of course, reach out to colleagues that uh, you might, contacts you might have at the system level who could, who could share more information. But I, I'd be happy to discuss more about some of the ongoing work of VCCS um, with you. Thank you. And we're going to share the presenter's email um, and also their contact information on the next slide, so you'll have that if you want to contact any of those presenters directly. And so we had another question that just came in from Amy in Wisconsin about are any states using National Student Clearinghouse data in accountability reporting? And then somebody from the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center, Rachel, um, responded that she doesn't know the answer off the top of her head, but, but she would get back to us. So I don't know if um, Susan or Ben, if you happen to know that. Um, this is Susan. Um, based on the ESSA plans that, um, that every student succeeds act plans that the states have submitted so far and states that I've spoken with in their planning, um, I'm not aware of them using them as an accountability measure. I am aware um, and there's, there's just some challenges with that. Um, while the National Student Clearinghouse has a substantial amount of data, they definitely don't have all of the data. Um, and um, quickly, stakeholder, conversations with stakeholders, um, they also want, it, they want information on whether students enroll, you know, enroll in a career, an apprenticeship, or military. And I think the data systems aren't quite up to par to really look at um, post-secondary outcomes at at all. So um, I think there's been a little bit of pushback there. I have seen um, states using this as um, kind of some, uh, reporting it back, like I, like I had mentioned with the Massachusetts example, to districts and schools to use as part of their consideration, but I haven't seen it used as part of an accountability measure. Okay, thanks, Susan. I love that the chat is going um, very active, and um, it's just, it seems like a lot of you are answering each other's questions and sharing ideas, so I really think that's great. Um, are there any other questions for the presenters? 
feel free to post those if you if you have them. Or the presenters, if you want to comment on anything that you've seen from the chat, um, please feel free to do so. We see that many people are typing, so I'm going to give you all a few more minutes. Um, we are a little bit ahead of schedule, so we have more time for questions. Oh, great. Yes, you did ask this earlier, Evan. Um, so the question is about, do you worry about equity impacts of using text as contacts, uh, as contacts? since the lowest SES users may not have unlimited text as part of their plans for financial reasons? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I think there's two dimensions of that. One is kind of equity impacts of using text, but I think an important related question is, um, by virtue of using text, are we potentially reducing equity gaps in access and completion? Uh, we have found across lots of studies um, that uh, take-up rates, meaning the share of students who sign up to receive text messages, are very high, uh, even in very low-income communities, um, and that very few students opt out of receiving text that we send. So opt-out rates 3%, 4% once we started messaging. It, it's a little higher when we're doing really large-scale um, campaigns where there's just less of a connection between the student and the sender. Um, but I think the fact that students are high, signing up at very high rates and opting out at low rates um, are uh, a prom an encouraging um, reassurance that, that this, these are uh, students find value in this outreach and it's not imposing a burden. I think that's also um, consistent with market data, which is that text, uh, cell phone usage and, and possession rates are very high across socioeconomic spectrums. And among people who have cell phones, which is increasingly the vast majority, text message rates are very, very high. Um, and over time, people have primarily shifted, no, though of course not across the board, to um, unlimited texting plans. The reason I think the equity gaps um, component of this is really important as well on, on the entry and completion side is that, as I showed you a moment ago, um, we find the largest effects of these campaigns for lowest income, first generation students, students at community colleges, students at the highest risk of withdrawal. Um, and so I would never make the case that I think we, we can rely only on kind of low touch scalable nudge strategies to address equity gaps. Of course, that requires ongoing investment in a whole host of important um, uh, societal resources, great, great schools, um, financial aid for students, and I would say that as a supplement to those existing resources, I do think we have some compelling evidence that these kinds of strategies can support reducing inequality in higher education. I think largely by providing uh, information and assistance to students who would otherwise not access them. That's great. Thanks, Ben. Um, and another question that came in is also probably directed at you, Ben, about wondering about the saturation of texting and if the summer melt nudges that we give students are ignored. Um, have you encountered that at all? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I, I wouldn't claim any definitive evidence on this. Um, I would say that, you know, when we started doing summer melt texting five years ago, um, I think they were really novel. Um, and therefore probably more impactful as um, lots of educational organizations have started texting students and their parents for that matter, um, starting in high school and going all the way through college. I think the, the lack of novelty or the saturation, depending on how you view it, is a challenge. Um, I would say that uh, I think the ways to, uh, there are several concrete suggestions I would make to overcome that. Um, one is to have your text be as personalized as possible, both to the student and who they're from. So, you know, if there's a, uh, if they can come from the student's counselor or a teacher or a prominent administrator. Um, so if I was an administrator messaging Jessica and I can say, hey, Jessica, it's Ben from Hand High School where I went in Connecticut. The student's much more likely to pay attention than if it's just generic. Um, messages are also likely to be more effective when they are written in a way to intentionally prompt interaction. Um, hey, Jessica, it's Ben. Uh, it was great seeing you at graduation. Just wanted to check, how are you doing um, getting ready for college? Um, students are much more likely to engage with that kind of message than a message that's just kind of one way, a one way, um, there's a word I'm looking for, announcement, but that's, there's something, 
you know, just kind of a burst, uh, uh, a one-way uh, message just designed to convey information, not prompt interaction. Um, so I think that's another strategy. Um, this one requires some, um, you know, some probably uh, analytic capacity or partnership, but, but I think, as I mentioned, we can increasingly use um, the same strategy that Netflix uses to tell us what movies to watch and Amazon uses to tell us what to buy to provide students with really personalized information. Uh, people are more responsive the more personalized the information is. And the fourth component I would mention um, is this kind of visual piece. So using SMS as a channel not just to, to, provide, to relay uh, text in the literal sense of words and phrases, but also well-designed um, infographics, visual information that convey information and capture attention. That's great. Good point. Thank you for sharing. We had another question come in about if your state doesn't have strong shared data and findings sharing between stakeholders, so you know, good communication between all those stakeholders, how do you recommend assisting in developing and supporting that sharing? And Ben or Susan, Peter, anyone, um, feel free to answer. This is Susan. I, I have an example um, that I've seen. So yeah, that is a challenge in some states that don't have it. Um, and so one example that I've seen is that, um, again, I think I mentioned this before, you know, a district or high school where they're sending a majority of their students to a specific institution. Um, or a majority, you know, more around 50% of their students to a specific institution or a few of them. Um, they've, uh, the, the district has actually convened meetings with um, folks from those post-secondary institutions to um, make uh, local or regional agreements with them to be able to get data and to find out what happens to the students who um, continue. I think Peter also mentioned um, the uh, post-graduation interview strategy, which is also one that I've heard about. Um, sounds like your school does that, Peter. I don't know if you have it, or your district does that, so I don't know if you have anything you want to add there. No, I think that you um, identify really the, those key elements, right? So it, it's really about being able to access the data systemically, but also to understand um, what the data means. And so a, a blend of quantitative and qualitative analysis is really what you need to do in order to develop the right strategy and actually get to some of the root causes. Yeah. And I mean, one other, one other strategy I've seen, uh, if the response rate is not typically great, is a post-graduation survey. Um, and so an alumni, an alumni survey, um, but again, those response rates can typically be um, low um, because you know there's a lot of movement between graduating from high school and you know one, two, three years out of high school. Right. So we actually try, we do a few things to entice students to come back and connect with us. So we, for example, at Thanksgiving, do a breakfast for alumni and invite them back and try to get them to share with us what's going on with them. We also uh, take their personal emails, obviously, as a district and, and get their permission to continue to connect with them uh, and just so we can try to keep track of them. So it's, it's an imperfect science, uh, but it is one that we try to build on the relationship that we have with them to round out the data that we're getting. Great idea. Okay, thanks, Susan and Peter. Well, it looks like our um, questions have whittled down and not many more people are typing. So um, thanks for, for um, sending all those questions in and for everyone being so um, interactive on today's webinar. So the last thing that I wanted to mention be before we do our official closing of the event, um, I just wanted to mention an interesting study that we're actually, uh, the RELNI team is conducting right now with the Rhode Island Office of the Post-Secondary Commissioner, see where those folks are on the webinar today. So um, we are investigating the effect of a text messaging intervention, similar to the ones that Dr. Kasselin described on post-secondary outcomes, such as enrollment and persistence, in Rhode Island public post-secondary institutions. And we're going to be recruiting Rhode Island schools in the new year and conducting the study starting next summer in 2018. And so we won't um, have the results for a couple of years. I thought I would just mention it to you that um, this is, 
you know, uh, a really great opportunity to measure the effectiveness of an intervention in a particular context. And it sounded like on the chat today, so many of you are using similar types of interventions, and whether it's, you know, through Remind.com or text messaging or something. And I, I was asking earlier if anyone was measuring the effectiveness of those. And I, I think it, we can learn a lot about these interventions and by doing studies like this one that I just mentioned that is going to be a randomized controlled trial. I think it's really important to um, see how, how are they faring and are they worth the time and effort. And, and everyone today did mention that they have some concerns about all of the time that it takes to collect this information. So I think doing your due diligence and doing some kind of um, measurement, it doesn't have to be a randomized controlled trial, but some kind of measurement to see are they working, I think is going to be really worthwhile. So I'm going to now turn it over to um, Ashley Gaddis to do a closing. And I just want to say thank you to our presenters and thanks to everyone who participated. Hi, so this is Ashley again. I just wanted to thank everyone for joining today. Uh, we had almost 300 participants, which is a fantastic uh, number, and we appreciate everyone taking the time. As I said earlier, today's webinar was recorded, and the recording will be archived and uploaded to the IES YouTube channel. If you registered for today's webinar, you'll, you will receive an email with a link to the recording when it is available. Additionally, don't forget to download today's files from the download pod. And again, thanks for participating and have a wonderful rest of your day.